Uh, it is a pleasure to have you join us, uh, not just as we open the Bible this morning, but also as we celebrate uh, with the Stubbs and the Chans uh, the baptism of their sons. Uh, we haven't picked this passage on purpose. We just happened to actually land on this passage that speaks of baptism uh, on, the t- on the day these two children are being baptized. Let me pray for us. Gracious God, we thank you that you speak in and through your word. And we want to pray right now as we open up the Bible that you might be so gracious as to help us understand this part of the Bible and what it says uh, and its significance for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, there is a sermon outline, your order of services. You might want to pull that out uh, and follow along. Uh, that might be helpful for you. Uh, as you know, over the last few months, uh, we've been working through the book of Romans. And the book of Romans really is a summary of the Christian faith, which is a wonderful book to come to terms with what Christians actually believe, uh, what the Bible actually teaches. And, and I suspect if you've been a regular here in the last few weeks and months, I'm, I'm hoping that it's become clearer to you that there's a common theme that runs through the book of Romans. In fact, if you're a guest or visitor uh, and you're not familiar with the Bible or with Christianity, the book of Romans, chapter after chapter, makes the unique claim that salvation is not something you earn. Forgiveness is not something you work for. Acceptance is not something you get by performing. It's a free gift that you receive. In fact, that's what makes Christianity unique. That's what makes Christianity different from religion or even the secular. Uh, Religion says you must be good enough to be saved. Uh, You must work to be forgiven. The secular says work hard, be strong, be smart enough, be beautiful enough to be accepted and loved in every sphere of life. Christianity actually says, salvation is not earned. It's never worked for. It's something you receive as a gift. And it's a free gift that you receive, not because you are deserving, not because you are beautiful or you have potential, but because Jesus has done the work to secure it for you. And so, here's the difference, right? In religion and the secular, you work to save yourself. Uh, It's not free, you must earn it, you work hard, and then you deserve it. Uh, In Christianity alone, salvation is a free gift that you receive because Jesus has worked to secure it for you. Now, that's what Paul has been saying from chapter 1 all the way through to the end of chapter 5, right? Chapter after chapter. So, the most obvious question is this, if salvation is a free gift, uh, and, and I do nothing to actually receive it, then it doesn't matter how I live. It means I'm free to live any way, right? Any way I want because salvation is free. Forgiveness will always be available. Why bother changing my life? That's the most obvious question. Why live any differently? Why would I want to change my life? I can take God's gift of salvation, His free gift of salvation, without buying into Christianity. Uh, it's the best of both worlds, Right? I get salvation for free, and I get to live my own life. Now, Paul is actually addressing that question. Can you do that? And Paul actually answers that very question in our passage today, uh, in the first 11 verses of Romans chapter 6. And there he'll say, he'll explain to us why it's not possible to receive God's gift of salvation and then remain unchanged in life. In fact, Paul will actually say, if you've truly understood the gift that has come to you, if you truly receive the gift, there would be a radical change in your life. Now, I'm going to look at our passage under two headings. You should have it there uh, in your outlines. Uh, I'm only going to look at the first five verses, uh, a break from the past and a baptism that changes everything. Okay, can you see there? A break from the past and a baptism that changes everything. So here's the first one, a break from the past. Have a look with me, verse 1 and verse 2. Notice what Paul says, if we have died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? We died to sin in the past. How then shall we live in it into the future? Now, what does Paul mean when he says Christian people have died to sin? Good question, isn't it? Uh, Now, I want to say to you, he's not saying that we will no longer sin or that uh, we will no longer struggle with sin, right? If you are... Uh, if you're a couple here at Grace Point and you're married, you know that to be true. The moment you got married, you, you realized the person you married was not perfect, right? So, so it's, it's Christian people will always sin and they will struggle with sin. The idea that Christian people no longer sin is a nonsense. Why? Because no one is morally perfect. Uh, the church is not a sinless community. I mean, the letters of the New Testament, if you know anything about the Bible, the letters of the New Testament are written to churches that are broken, 
struggling, fallen, written to challenge and rebuke and correct sin in the life of the church. Christians taking advantage of each other. Christians engaged in sexual immorality. Proud Christians, greedy Christians, worldly Christians, gossiping and slanderous Christians, divisive Christians, unforgiving Christians. That's what the letters of the New Testament are actually doing, right? The list is endless. And what will actually happen in those letters in the New Testament when Paul writes to the broken, sinful churches, repeatedly he will say in the words of Taylor Swift, shake it off, right? Maybe you got tickets this week, maybe you didn't. I had all these friends uh, with daughters, and they were all online trying to get tickets for their daughters. In fact, they posted like, you know, look, some of them couldn't get tickets. Anyone got spares and stuff like that. Uh, My daughter, fortunately, no longer a Taylor Swift fan, so it was good. We saved money. Right? She's gone beyond Taylor Swift. She's gone beyond BTS. So that's great. But effectively, that's what Paul says in his letters in the New Testament. Shake it off because that's not who you are. That's the old you. The life of sin before Jesus saved you. So learn to shake it off in your life. Right? Now, if it were true that Christian people no longer sin, there would be no need for Paul to make his appeal in verse 12 and verse 13, and we'll look at that next week. Pastor Peter Hughes will be here next week. He will look at that with us. So what does Paul mean when he says, verse 2, we are those who have died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? Now, to make sense of what this means, we have to very quickly go back to chapter 5, what we looked at last week. Because chapter 5 explains what it means for us to die to sin. Now, there in chapter 5, very quick summary for us, Paul has told us that the world in which we live, the world in God's economy isn't divided by race or culture or ethnicity, right? It's divided by two rules people live under in life, okay? There's two rules. Actually, only one rule everyone lives under until Jesus comes onto the scene. Paul, in the previous chapter, has said that all people live under the rule of Adam in life. Uh, The opening chapters of the Bible tells the story of God's good creation gone wrong uh, because Adam, the one who represents us, right, because of his failure, his disobedience, his rebellion, we live in a world that's broken. His sin is our sin. It's the Bible's way of saying that you and I were born into a broken world, a world of sin, and as you heard Warren share, a world of death. It's the Bible's way of saying that we live in a world of sin and death, and there is no escape, is there? Now, you don't have to be a Christian this morning to recognize that the world is a broken place or that life is broken. You know, Christian or not, religious or secular, everyone lives under the tyranny of sin and death, the ultimate brokenness that separates us from life and love, that we avoid thinking about, that we refuse to accept, Everyone lives under the rule of sin and death. Why? Because everyone sins and everyone dies. It's the ultimate brokenness and suffering in life. But the story of the Bible isn't just a story of why there's brokenness in the world. It's also the story of what God does to save. Uh, The Bible is uh, not an instruction book on what you do to save yourself, how you can be good enough to save yourself. That's not what the Bible's about. The Bible is about what God does to save. It's the story of what God does to save, what God does to break the rule of sin and death in our lives, what God does to reverse the effects of sin and death in our lives. And so what actually happens in the storyline of the Bible, Jesus comes as the second Adam, a better Adam. He comes effectively as the hero of heroes to represent us. And so if you move back with me very quickly, some of you will have your Bibles with you. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, look at you know, alongside the person next to you. Uh, Chapter 5, verse 17 to verse 19. Chapter 5, verse 17 to verse 19. It actually says, For if by the sin of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life over death through the other man, Jesus Christ? And then we read, As one sin resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification, a way to be made right and life for all people. Just as true the disobedience of one man, Adam, the many were made sinners, so also true the obedience of one man, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. And so that's that's how God rescues, right, in the storyline of the Bible. The one for the many. 
right? The one for the many dying for our sin. Judgment and guilt placed on Him so that we might know forgiveness. The one for the many living the perfect, obedient life so that we might know His righteousness, His beauty, His goodness that we could never attain in life ourselves. Uh, The one for the many who overcomes and overturns death for us so that we might know resurrection. The promise of life and love returned to us. He breaks the tyranny of death. Now, even if you're not a Christian here this morning, and you're not, you're, you, you, you would not be unfamiliar with the principle of representation, because that's how God works. God works on the principle of representation. Notice how uh, when your footy team wins, what do you say? We won. Uh, you know, when your sporting team loses, you say, we lost. Even though you didn't lift a finger, you didn't kick a ball, and you weren't playing on that field. Did you realize in every sphere of life, right, every sphere of life works on the principle of representation, where the best, the strongest, the most able, the smartest, the most beautiful always represent us. The Olympics, the Mr. Olympia, the Miss Universe, the biggest academic competition in the world, the Harvard, MIT, Mats tournament, even in politics, we always want those who can deliver to represent us. The world works on the principle of representation. And you know, every culture has actually got stories of heroes, not just in uh, mythology, but also in their history. Heroes who represent them in the face of tyranny, in the face of injustice. Rizal in the Philippines, Gandhi in India, Tiradentes in Brazil, on and on it goes. Men and women who represent the many, who do for the many what they can't do for themselves, who speak for the many, who defend the many, who fight for the many, who die for the many. Why is that? I think we want the best and strongest to represent us because we know in so many areas of life, if we try to represent ourselves, right, whether we care to admit it, we would fail. Everyone wishes they had a hero in life who could represent them. Paul says, when it comes to the rule of sin and death in our lives, there is actually only one man able to represent us. There's only one hero able to save, and that's Jesus. Religion says, represent yourself and pay for your guilt and sin in life. Make up for your past failures. Christianity says Jesus will represent you and die for your guilt and shame so that you can know absolute forgiveness. Religion says represent yourself and live a good life. Be beautiful enough, be good enough for God to accept you. Christianity says Jesus will represent you and live the good life for you. His obedience becomes yours, His beauty yours, His goodness yours. The secular says, death is just nature taking its course. There's nothing after. Don't think too much about it because, you know, you get depressed. Make the best of life. Carry on. But like I said last week, in the face of death, we grieve. We wish for life and love return to us when we experience death. Your head, right, might tell you that it's biology at work, but your heart tells you something is wrong and you want life and love returned to you. You know, Christianity actually echoes your heart because it says death is not the way things should be. That's the reason why you grieve. It's the consequence of a broken world. And Jesus will actually represent you in the face of death, overcoming it for you in His resurrection so that you might know the promise of life and love returned. Christianity actually echoes what your heart wants, life and love returned to you. Religion and the secular say, save yourself, do your best, soldier on in the face of your sin and death, earn your way. Christianity says, Jesus comes to save. Let Jesus represent you in the face of sin and death. The one who dies for your sin, the one who lives the perfect obedient life that you could not live, and the one who overturns death for you. Notice that, you know, the world of religion and the world of the secular says, you be the hero in your salvation story. Christianity says, let Jesus be the hero in your salvation story. You know, you might not be a Christian. You might not, you might not even believe it's possible. There's actually a way to have all your sins forgiven, guilt removed, 
to know a future where death is no longer going to be the last word. But it's worth taking a step back, isn't it? It's worth pausing and asking. If you had to choose a way, right? If you had to choose a way between the way of religion, the way of the secular, or the way of Christianity, which would you choose? You might not want to believe it, but I suspect if we had to, we just did the hypothetical, we'd all like to believe that the claims of Christianity were true because it answers the deepest longings of our heart. And if He is your hero, notice verse 2, something radical takes place. Notice, we are those who have died to sin and its consequences. We have died to sin and the penalty of sin, the old reality under Adam. We have died to its rule, sin and death in our lives. We're, we're no longer living under the claim of sin and its penalty in our lives. We feel its impact, we experience its effects, but sin and death is not going to be the final word. The final word is forgiveness and life and love return. We are now a people who are living under a new reality, the rule of Jesus and all that He promises. So this is the logic, right? Under the old reality, before you became a Christian, there would have been an old normal, right? You lived a certain way. Under this new reality, now that you've become a Christian and, and come under the rule of Jesus, there should be a new normal in your life, okay? It's like you walked out of one room through a door into another room, and the door is closed to the old room in your life, okay? Now, it's a basic principle that's true for everyone. Old reality, old normal. New reality, new normal. Uh, Christian or not, it's a general principle in life. As reality changes, so does our normality in life. Uh, let me give you an example, right? If you're a student, there's a couple of high school students here. Some of you have parents, your kids go to school, so you know uh, most of the year, if you're a student, school is your reality. It's what dominates your life. It's what controls your time, your schedule. The reality of uh, school affects your life. It affects your normality each day, right? It dictates what time you wake up. Uh, your day is controlled by it, and even after school, your life is controlled by it. I, I feel for your hi the high school students here, homework, tutoring, music practice, sport practice, finishing assessments, preparing for exams, right? It's just your parents' way of keeping you busy, right? For, s for some of you, it feels like enslavement, right? If you're a high school student, it feels like enslavement, but notice what happens at the end of the year. Your reality changes, doesn't it? New reality, you come under the reality of the summer holidays, okay? And when that happens, your normality changes, your day changes, your routines changes, uh, you're no longer living under the old reality of school, you now live under the new reality of the summer holidays, and life changes. Your wake-up time changes, you now sleep in, you sleep late, it changes your day, you game all day, you watch YouTube all day, unless you have tiger parents. But you get it, right? The new reality of the summer holidays now changes things in your life. There is a new normal in the way you live your life. See, as reality changes, your normality changes. Some of you here are young parents, or going to be parents, right? Before you had kids, double income, no kids was your reality. Eat out whenever you want to, go to the movies, buy what you want, travel anywhere. That shaped your weekends, your lifestyle, that was your normal each day, each weekend. Double income, no kids, your reality. Then you had kids, right? I don't know, Jefferson and Angel Fielders, right? Suddenly, your reality changed. You had kids. And then, oink, becomes your reality. One income, no kid. New kid, new kid, sorry. One income, new kid. Oink, right? Or DIM, D-I-N-M, double income, no money. Okay? That's, that's more like it, right? Double income, no money, because it's expensive. So, no more sleep becomes your new reality. You change over 3,000 nappies over the next three years. That becomes your new normal. I actually did the sums when our kids are really, really small. I was like, oh my goodness, how long is this going to go for? It worked out we're going to like over 3,000 nappies in three years, right? Uh, you don't go out to watch any movies anymore for the next five years. That becomes your new normal. As reality changes, so does your normality. That's how life works. Now, this is what Paul is saying in this passage. We are those who have died to sin and to tyranny, therefore our lives have changed. New normality. Your status has changed and your future has changed, and then you begin to live accordingly, right? There's a new normal in your life. It's not possible that you would continue living in sin. It's, it's not possible that you, you would continue living in a life where you treat God's Word and His way with contempt in life. 
the idea that you can be an athlete but never run is a nonsense, right? A non-practicing athlete is not an athlete. The idea that you can be a soccer player but never actually play soccer is a nonsense. A non-practicing soccer player is not a soccer player. Well, Paul's actually saying the idea that someone can be a Christian but not live the Christian life is simply a nonsense. A non-practicing Christian is a non-Christian. And so the way we live our lives actually reflects whether we live under the rule of sin and death or whether we live under the rule of Jesus. That's what Paul's saying. Jesus says, Matthew 7, you can tell a tree by its fruit, by the fruit it bears. And so when God's gift of salvation is received, there'll be a break from the past and there'll be a change in the way you live your life because you now live under a new reality, a new status and a new future. Now, Paul now tells us why in verse 3 and verse 5. So you have your Bibles, look with me at verse 3 and verse 5 because he says, a baptism has taken place in your life and it's a baptism that changed everything. Okay? Now, verse 3 and verse 5 actually describes how someone actually becomes a Christian. Uh, and again, I want you to notice that we do nothing. We benefit from what Jesus does for us because of our association with Him. It's benefits by association. We are recipients in both physical water baptism and spiritual baptism. So look at verse 3. He says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So this is what happens, right? Uh, in the world of the New Testament, when someone actually became a Christian, uh, what would happen is they would be baptized externally with water. Uh, Jesus commanded that in Matthew chapter 28. His final words, He says, Go, make disciples, and baptize them. Okay? And so when someone became a Christian, what would happen is they would immediately be baptized into the name of Jesus. Uh, coming un it's, a, it's coming under His rule, uh, identifying with Him as their hero of heroes in life, uh, trusting Him as their Savior and King. Now, that's an external act. But notice what Paul says about baptism. The external act of baptism actually points to something much deeper. It points, right, something to something more. It signifies more than water being poured out on someone. What does it signify? It signifies the death and the resurrection of Jesus and our connection with Jesus in His death and resurrection. Uh, it, it points, actually, to a historical event, a past event, and our connection with that past event, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, have a look at verse 3. He says, all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death. We died with Jesus. And then verse 4, we were there, buried with Him through baptism into death, in order that just as Jesus was raised from the dead, we too may live a new life. We rose with Jesus. Notice, all this takes place before water baptism. Uh, water baptism is a sign of our dying and our rising with Jesus 2,000 years ago an external sign of the internal work of God in our lives that takes place. The waters of baptism washing over us. His death for sin becomes our death. His death uh, because secures our forgiveness. His resurrection over death becomes our resurrection to new life, changing our status and our future. Forgiven and life and love returned. Right? So, baptism is actually like the door right? Between two rooms. Uh, the door is open. You're in that first room. It's open. Uh, it's, it, and the room is filled with darkness. The door is open. The light shines in. You see the, the door. The door is open, and you walk through the door into the new room. And the door is shut to the old room behind you. That's what it is. Uh, it's like a shadow that points to the real thing. Uh, and when you personally receive God's salvation in Jesus, that was your real baptism. When you accepted God's gift of salvation in your life, when you trusted Jesus to save you, you had your first baptism, right? You were joined with Jesus in His death and resurrection 2,000 years ago. What happened to Him happened to you. Uh, what He secured became yours. And so now when you are baptized with water, your second baptism, it's an external sign of the internal reality. And so let me be very, very clear, right? Because in a moment we will baptize uh, the two children. Uh, the practice of water baptism is only a sign. 
He doesn't save. Uh, if, if water baptism saves people, all we do is, right, we just, we just turn on the sprinklers, okay? Or we get a hose and just hose everyone down, okay? No, it's a pointer to what Jesus does for us in His death and resurrection 2,000 years ago. And us being joined with Him so that we benefit from His death and resurrection. Notice, Jesus doesn't just represent us. Paul says we are joined with Jesus in His death and resurrection, such that we become beneficiaries of His work. That's why verse 5 says, if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we will certainly also be united with Him in a res resurrection like His. You know the word united is a gardening term, right? For most of us, that means nothing because we don't garden. To be united is to actually be grafted into a plant, grafted into a plant so that you benefit really from the plant. So what's Paul saying? Paul's saying we have been grafted into the death and resurrection of Jesus. His past is our past. We benefit from His death. His future is our future. We benefit from His resurrection. You died and you rose with Jesus when you received His gift of salvation in your first baptism. And so this is how God saves. You are always a recipient in baptism. You benefit by association, by being united to Jesus' work, by being grafted into His saving work. Now, the, the, the best way for me to explain this by way of illustration is I thought about it, you know, I saw Terrence and Elias sitting over there. And uh, imagine with me for a moment, right, because Elia is a primary school teacher. Uh, imagine with me that Elia is super rich, like crazy rich Asian, okay? Uh, and that she's accomplished all this by her effort, her intellect, her entrepreneurial drive. She's, come, she's become effectively uh, top three in the world of primary education programs online. Okay, that's an idea, isn't it, Elia? Her, her hard work means that uh, she has 90% of the China market in primary education online. And so she's become crazy rich Asian, okay? Now, all this she accomplished by her hard work and effort before she got married. Now, Terrence, he's broke. He got nothing, okay? And then he marries Elia. Oh, wow, okay? But when he marries Elia, something happens. Their legal union means that her riches now become his riches. Her wealth becomes his wealth. He's no longer poor. Now, you pause with me for a moment and think about it, right? He did nothing to deserve it. Okay, Elias nodding her head. Okay. He didn't contribute to anything. He didn't work together. He simply married Elia. They become legally united, whereby he, be he becomes a recipient of all of Elias' wealth, all of her riches. I want to say to you this morning, that is how grace works in the Bible. That's how God saves. Everything Jesus has accomplished and done in His death and resurrection becomes yours because you are united. You are legally united and joined to Him. You died and you rose with Jesus. And so God now looks at you and He treats you the way He would treat His Son, free from condemnation, as if you had died from all your sins, because you're united with Jesus in His death. As He died for your sin, you died. Notice verse 7. Anyone who has died with Jesus has been set free from the consequences of sin. But then your future is also secure when you trusted Jesus because you were united with Jesus in His resurrection. Sin and death will never be the last word. Life and love restored is the last word because He rose over sin and death. And notice verse 8. If we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him, rise with Him, no longer living under the sentence of death. Death will not be permanent. Life and love will be returned. Now, if you are a Christian today, you've already been baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus. It took place when you looked to Jesus as your hero of heroes in life. It took place when you trusted Him. All the benefits of His death and resurrection has become yours. And so in Christianity, salvation comes because of the work of another for us. A baptism has taken place in Jesus, and we have been grafted, united, joined into His death and resurrection, and so we benefit. See, the narrative of religion is that you must pay for your sins, earn your forgiveness, or be good enough to merit God's acceptance. You must do and do and do to be saved. 
You must be the hero in your salvation story. That's the narrative of religion. In fact, that's the narrative of the secular as well. The narrative of the Bible and the narrative of Christianity is that you cannot pay for your sins. Death is your destiny. It's the destiny of all people. It's the tyranny we live under. You can't earn forgiveness and you will never be good enough to merit God's acceptance. And so, you must trust what Jesus has done, what He's done, what He's done, and not what you do. You look to Him to be the hero of hero in your salvation story, baptized into His death and resurrection. Now, Paul will go on to speak about the implications of that for our lives, what life now looks like. Yeah, we'll look at that next week, or Pastor Peter Hughes will look at that next week. But here I want to say to you that where God's gift of salvation has been received, there will be a break from the past. There will be a distinct before and after. Why? Because a baptism has taken place and a new reality has dawned and has come and entered into your life. Life cannot be the same. And that's why Paul says, verse 2, if we are those who have died to sin and its penalty, how can we continue living a life of sin anymore? And then right at the end in verse 11, he says, count yourself dead to the penalty of sin. Jesus has dealt with your past, your sin, your future is secure in His death and resurrection. Count yourself now alive to God. Life cannot be the same. You know, it's, it's like Terence and Elia, right? They, they're married. His legal status has changed from single man to married guy. His lifestyle has changed from single guy to now living like a married man, right? So, you know, he doesn't game at night anymore because he spends all his time with Elia. When Elia wants to go for a run, he accompanies her because he takes up the stuff that she enjoys doing. His life has changed. He doesn't live like a single guy anymore, like a prisoner, right, who has been released, freed, having done their time. Their legal status has changed from convicted, right, to now being free to run with Elia. His lifestyle has changed, right? That's what's happened. You've walked out the prison doors, things have changed. Now, let me draw a few points of reflection and application this morning. So, you've got that there in our conclusion. Three things I want to highlight. Number one, if there's been no change in your lifestyle, and you call yourself a follower of Jesus, it's, it's likely that you're still living under the rule of sin and death. It's likely that you've never been baptized into Jesus' death and resurrection. The fruit of your life represents the tree that's present. Whether you are grafted into Jesus, whether you are united to Jesus, there'll be certain fruit. I mean, and that, that's the witness of the New Testament, you know. Galatians 5, Paul speaks of the fruit of the old life versus the fruit of the new life. Uh, Ephesians 5, where Paul speaks, where previously we live as children of darkness, but he says now we live as children of light. There's a change. The idea that someone can be a Christian and live an unchanged life is simply a myth, or at the very least, it's delusional. Now, don't get me wrong. Changing your life does not save you. The Bible doesn't operate like that. But the Bible does teach that a change, the saved life will be a changed life. Let me say that again. The Bible teaches that a saved life will be a changed life. And so here's a question to reflect on this morning, especially if you're a regular here at Grace Point. Since becoming a follower of Jesus, what's changing in your life? What's changed? What needs to change? If you've, if you've been baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus, if you died to sin, uh, to your old life, and you've been raised to new life, no longer under tyranny of sin and death, what have you actually died to, right? What do you need to leave behind? What do you need to rise to? What do you need to embrace as part of that new life? And there were questions worth asking for many of you here who are regulars at Grace Point, who profess faith in Jesus, claim to be disciples of Jesus, been Christians for a while. Those are serious questions, and they're worth asking. Number two, Change comes when you continue to remember your baptism into Jesus' death and resurrection, right? Can a married woman live as though that she were single? Of course it's possible. It's not impossible. But let her remember who she is. Let her feel her wedding ring, the symbol of her union, her joining to her husband, and she, she will live accordingly. Can Christians live as though they were still under the rule of sin and death, living unchanged lives, engaged in a pattern of disobedience without sorrow or desire to change, living in contempt for God and His Word? Well, it's possible, but same, the same thing holds. Let them remember who they are. 
Let them remember their baptism 2,000 years ago, the symbol of their life joined to Jesus in His death and resurrection. If you've been baptized with water, look back to your water baptism. It's an external sign of your union, your joining with Jesus, grafted into His work, His death and His resurrection for you. That's why verse 11 reads, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Count, reckon, consider, remember, and call to mind. It's an ongoing thing we're called to do. It's a past event that you must revisit and recall. If you're a Christian, I want to say to you, learn to live in the past. Not the past of your sin, but the past of Jesus' work for you. Stand each day at the foot of the cross and count yourself dead to sin and alive to God. See your death and resurrection in Jesus because they actually stop you from moving back to your old way of life. It makes it unthinkable that you would return to your old way of life. See, our baptism stands like a door between two rooms. It closes on the one and it opens to the other. And if that's true, how can we possibly live again in what we have died to? You know, there's actually two approaches to Christian living. Uh, Prevention versus corrective theology. Two approaches to Christian living. We're more familiar with the second one, corrective theology. So much of our time is spent in corrective theology. What we do when we sin, right? And so, for example, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, God is faithful, He forgives and purifies us. And that's good and necessary, isn't it? Because the Christian life is going to be marked by failure and stuff-ups, right? And, And struggle and temptation that we succumb to. And so, we need to confess our sin. But notice, that's you know, that, that approach is basically corrective, right? There is another approach. It's called preventive theology, where we, we reflect, basically, where we consider and reckon and remember and revisit Jesus and His death and resurrection for us. Because when we do that, it curbs our sinning. This is counting ourselves dead to sin, reminding ourselves each day of the new reality we are under, the door through which we have walked into a new room, a life we now belong to, and that helps us fight and avoid sin. And so each day, keep on counting yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Here's number three. The way of salvation in Christianity is not through your work, but through identifying yourself with Jesus' work. You see, religion operates on the principle of self-representation. Christianity operates on the principle of the representation of another for you. Religion says, the secular says, you be the hero of your salvation story. Christianity says, let Jesus be the hero of your salvation story. In in religion, religion says, you know, you work to benefit. In Christianity, Christianity says, you identify with Jesus to benefit. Religion says, you pay for your own sins. Christianity says, let Jesus deal with your sins. Let God baptize you in the death and resurrection of Jesus Let God unite you and join you into the death and resurrection of Jesus so that you receive all His benefits. Maybe you're here this morning and you're religious, or maybe you're a secular person. You know, the good news is that the benefits you are looking for in life, and everyone is looking for this, a way to deal with sin and guilt, a way to deal with failure in life, a a, a way to deal with hidden shame, a way to deal with the past, that we are always trying to make up for, well, that has been made possible because of Jesus, who says, stop trying to fix your past, stop trying to pay for your guilt, stop trying to make up for your failures in life. Jesus paid for it for you in His death. The good news is that the one tyranny and suffering in life that everyone is trying to avoid, everyone's trying to avoid it, right, Christian or not, Well, the good news is death has been overthrown. The ultimate suffering has been dealt with. The ultimate tyranny has has been dealt with in Jesus who smashed through death in His resurrection for us. And the good news is that if you identify with Him, right, if you look to Him to be the hero of heroes in your life, if you trust Him, you will be baptized. You'll be joined with Him grafted into His death and resurrection for you, and what He has won becomes yours today. Let me pray for us. Gracious God, we thank You that Jesus has come to be the hero of heroes in our world, and He's made it possible in our lives. 
And so we look to you today. Help us trust you and your provision for us. We thank you that at the cross, Jesus represents us not just in his death for our sin, but in the breaking through and the overcoming of death for us so that we might share in the benefits of the power of the resurrection. And so we thank you that our status and our future has changed. And so this morning, help us trust the one who has come for us, the many. Amen.